area. Um, but we have somebody that actually works in Australia, so <laughs> I'm not the furthest away. Okay. She well, works. She she works on weird hours. Yeah, whole different time, whole different day. <laughs> yeah. So can somebody tell Gary what we have from OBT? We, I know we've been doing a bunch of purchasing lately. Joe, can you do it? Well, the big story is we bought a 16-inch TPO Richie Gretchen, and Ooh, nice. we, we ended up sending it back to you guys. <laughs> oh. That's a Oops. long story I'm not going to get into. <laughs> Before anyway, my time, yeah. anytime, anyway, we're working on spending our store credit because we got a store credit. <laughs> understood, understood. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to talk to any of you guys. Uh, I'm there Monday to Friday, uh, nine to six uh, East Coast time. So, which I guess is six to three Pacific. So, Gary, yeah, it's weird. Take your screen off, then we can see everybody better. My screen. Yeah, just, your, just your share. Stop, stop sharing the screen. You can stop sharing, I guess. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And um, yeah, we have some uh, very capable Astro imagers here. We have uh, John McDonald on right now, and uh, David Lee, Dave and of course Mike Nash. Um, so, so, Brock. Those Brock's there? Yeah, hi there. Yeah. And as I was saying in our chat, uh, they, they, they tend to avoid the moon. <laughs> Although I've been uh, apparently motivating a few people in the club to, to look at that bit of light pollution up there uh, as a target. Yeah, I, oh. uh, I enjoy looking at it. That's Mike's specialty. That's all I shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, with uh, any luck, Brian, we'll send you all into lunatics tonight. <laughs> in one way or another. But Brian's becoming quite the uh, the imager as well. He's been taking some really uh, some stunning images of the sun. Yeah, you talk about light pollution. Boy, there's the ultimate example. <laughs> but it's only during the day. <laughs> and some would argue it is the day <laughs> yeah it's like where does the sun go at night you know it's like you got to send the uh the solar probe at night so there won't be any uh, you know any excessive heat <laughs> i could see some solar work in my future i mean it's just need filters that's it yeah yeah i'm uh i, I think i'm about to make the step I've been having a lot of fun with the H alpha. I'm uh, about to make the step into the calcium K line. So that's coming soon. Very cool. Is anybody in our club doing calcium or just the uh, hydrogen alpha? I haven't heard of anybody doing anything but H alpha. No, we I did know. have one one member did try calcium, but uh, I think it's all been HA. Correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think that's about right. Yeah, I, I think somebody um, somebody had a filter, but it wasn't a, a specific calcium telescope, as far as I understand. Yeah. Yeah, Edmonton has a calcium K line filter, but uh, it's really not much use visual observing. They have it and then yeah. having put a camera on it because the image is so dim. Yeah, it's it's in the ultraviolet, so it's really not not suitable for visual observing. Unless you've had cataract surgery, then my understanding <laughs> is uh, your your lens becomes transparent to uh, ultraviolet. Really? Is that true? I didn't know that. Yeah, I think so. I think that's why they recommend that you wear protection, like UV protection. Or I think I think they might have, um, like in the lens itself, it might be UV rated. No, that's why when you see me outside in the daytime, I wear sunglasses all the time. <laughs> I have to ask my optometrist.
So Chris, I'll do a little introduction of our guests. Sure, that would be great. I'm kind of leaving tonight in your hands. Great. Okay, sir. well, then I'd like to know if anybody else has things that they're planning on uh, presenting tonight. Um, we do have, uh, was it two short videos and some photos um, from Dave, um, if there's time. Uh, okay, we yeah, we'll do that after the um, our guests. And um, Randy, I have a guest that I would like to introduce. Oh, cool. Who is it, Margaret? Uh, Brenda. Brenda, hey, Brenda is here. I met her yesterday while bird watching. She, uh, at Swan Lake, she had uh, seen, she, she recognized me from our Astronomy Day presentation. Well, so excellent. Brenda is here. She owns a telescope and She's seeing what we do on Monday night at Astro Cafe. Well, that's super. Welcome, Brenda. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted Randy, to hang out and see what you guys do. Okay. <laughs> uh, Randy, could you maybe uh, give me about five minutes? I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, variable stars. Okay, we'll do that right after the uh, our, our, our guests. And so uh, I'm going to take the screen. Boom and hello. I don't have the right screen on. Stop this. We were getting some moon photos in a map, so <laughs> I guess that's my walking path to get to you guys later. So. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. Maybe try and resharing. Share and share a different screen. Yeah. I shared the wrong screen, obviously. Um, we'll do it this way. And it's the wrong one again. We'll get there. A very similar image of that I'm going to show. OK. So I want to say what started all this. First of all, this is uh, Mike Nash's picture that he did um, on January 22nd, and it's got my favorite crater. I think you guys know by now is Clavius, the second largest on the visible side. And it's got mm -hmm. this wonderful sequence of um, craterlets. So you can kind of calibrate how good you're seeing is each night. And then these guys, you know, these are about 15 kilometers across. These guys are about eight. When you're over here, they're about four kilometers. Very hard to see in the eyepiece, but uh, you know Mike is able to, to get excellent resolution. But that same night, Gary in Florida took a picture almost at the same time. If you go back and forth, you can see that uh, Mike's is a little bit later. There's a bit of illumination on the crests over here that uh, Gary didn't have over in Florida. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's really interesting to me is the deformation between the two. And that is because of the 5,000 kilometers between them. There's a difference in parallax. And so I've got this hope of getting Gary and Mike to take pictures actually at the same time. And then I'll uh, try to see if I can figure out uh, how far away the moon is. That, that's my hope. But um, meanwhile, I, Gary has this fantastic Facebook group, the Amateur Astronomy Selenology Project. And Mike sometimes uh, posts there and then there's this banter going between Gary and Mike. And I, I, I just mm -hmm. like seeing the community you know, what, what unites us as amateur astronomers across the thousands of kilometers. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then Gary started posting these pictures of the Lunar 100. The Lunar 100, uh, Chuck Wood, oh, probably 20 years ago, um, mm -hmm. posted in Sky and Telescope his choice of 100 features from really easy. The first one is the moon. 
and then it gets down to you know once you get past 60 they're very very hard to find and uh gary is um posting these pictures of of, of the the lunar 100 and i am kind of following this with with great interest so um i uh decided to uh propose getting gary and mike on at the same time i asked gary to do a uh, 50 word autobiography so he's an amateur astronomer planetary astrophotographer he's the creator of that facebook page that i like so much and uh, owner operator of varney observatory coincidence of name there isn't it in florida and since march he says he's been uh working uh for opt and so maybe somebody in our club has already phoned him anyway when I started hatching this idea, then Gary says, what would be also really good would be to get Brian Day aboard. Brian is uh, at Ames Research. This is his uh, quick biography. Uh, he was with the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. I hope you're gonna tell us what that means, Brian. And he manages data visualization analysis projects supporting missions, including Artemis. And I saw that you're involved with uh, like Mars and, and other um, planetary uh, destinations for, for NASA. And very important for us, he was the education public outreach lead for the LCROSS and LADI lunar missions as participated in various Mars analog field studies. So I am really, really pleased to invite our uh, international guests tonight. And uh, I'm gonna stop the share and invite Gary to take over. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Um, very, very honored uh, to be here with you folks. Um, and uh, I guess, uh, Randy, I, I just figured out what that is in your backdrop there. I guess that's a sketch. That's or, you got or you got frustrated with a pencil there at some point. <laughs> but that's interesting. Uh, yeah, nice, very, very good work. Um, so, all right, so let me, um, yeah, my, uh, what I did is um, after my parents had passed, um, I wanted to get myself a really nice telescope and uh, I named my home observatory uh, in their honor. So that's where, uh, that's where that name comes from. Um, so every time I look up at the, at the sky, you know, I think about them. So, uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, what I did is uh, I put together um, an abbreviated uh, video of how I process uh, images. Um, it's about nine minutes in length, so, um, but it it's very, very quick. I guess if anybody remembers Evelyn Wood speed reading, this is like the Evelyn Wood version of how I, <laughs> how I process images. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen and, uh, and kick that off for you. There's my telescope, but uh, 11 inch, this is one of them. This is my 11 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain Edge HD. Um, the red device here is uh, my Eagle 2 Pro from Prima Lucha Lab. Uh, 16 millimeter spotting scope uh, here on top, which I have right, uh, this is a, a QHY 462 color camera. I have it, I was doing some testing with it, trying to get some full lunar disk images with it. This is my Altair um, uh, IMX 174 monochrome camera that I use uh, primarily for my video imaging. Filter wheel here, 2X Barlow. Uh, and then the, the JMI wheelie bars that I got, my, my, my lower back issues demanded that I get something to make it easier to get my scope out. I just push it out of the driveway and um, it thanks me every time I do that. <laughs> Gary, so, let me go. Do yes. you operate it on the wheels or is it uh, locked on legs when it gets in position? Uh, it's, it's on the cart all the time. Um, I just push it out and then there are uh, three bolts that uh, thread down and you level it uh, in that fashion. So it stays on the cart and I get it level and then I turn it on. I turn on the Eagle, which is a Windows 10 uh, PC. And that's where I do my, both my cameras are connected to that. But yeah, it stays on the cart and then it makes breaking down so easy. There's an electric drill um, fitting that goes on and just, 
you know, take, take the screws back up from the cart, push it back into the garage. So yeah, my, my observatory door goes up and down instead of open above. <laughs> it's my garage door. <laughs> so uh, let me go ahead and um, kick off this video here. I can remember, there it is. Um, just have to make sure before I do this, that I'm sharing my sound um, in the meeting. Let me just check that real quick. Oh, sorry. I just keep coming back up more. Um, share sound is on. Okay, perfect. So let me go ahead and start this. Um, and then if you have any questions, you know, after we do Q&A, we can, uh, you know, talk about uh, some of the steps in here. So let me go ahead and start it. The playback from a capture uh, June 20th, 0111 Universal Time, which was 9 11 p.m. on the 19th. Uh, region of interest on the camera here was full uh, 1920 by 1200, 13.9 millisecond exposure. The gain settings are around 48%. You can see seeing was average to a little above average, just a little wateriness to it here. So what I'll do now is uh, load this into Auto Stacker and show that particular part of the process. You guys can hear this, right? right. So Auto Stacker three, uh, first step is to place the image stabilization anchor here. Uh, that's done by holding down Control and just clicking, and you put it on some area in the image that has a lighter, uh, you know, lighter texture, lighter um, feature to it. It just gives it a good anchor point. Um, make sure this is set for surface. I do improve tracking since there's a little bit of drift since I just did a, a very quick planetary alignment noise robust setting here under the Laplacian, uh, which is enabled. And then you click analyze and it is going to go through and do the surface stabilization and buffering and analysis. I'll pause while that does that. Right now it's completed. You can see the time it took here for each level. Uh, what that has done is gone through and looked at all the 3,000, I think 3,008 frames we had here. So it rearranges them in order of best to worst. And that is reflected by this little green um, quality graph here. This line in the back was the original order that they were in. So now what you do is you want to place your alignment points. I just usually set it at 200, turn on multi-scale, um, place in grid, and it'll go in and place um, the alignment points where it feels they're necessary. And then the multi-scale will place um, larger alignment points as it feels uh, needed into the image to determine the best quality. Just really large one that is placed here. There's a couple more. And now it's finished. So what I'd like to do is I don't keep anything below 50%. So somewhere right around in here. Uh, so you do control and click and it automatically fills in the percentage here. So we're going to keep 64% of these frames and I don't do sharpening. I do that myself. RGB align is grayed out as this is a monochrome capture. Um, IR 650 nanometer filter and then we're going to go ahead and click stack and then I'll pause the video and we'll come back when it's finished. Okay now stacking is complete. You can see all these different steps and the time each one has taken so there's been a few minutes but now the 64% um, the of all these frames uh, that we kept are now aligned and stacked and flattened into one single image, which we will now um, take into Registax for sharpening. Okay, now we've loaded this into Registax. Uh, this is the where you do the wavelet sharpening here on these six uh, sliders here on the left. I have some preset schemas here, so I'm just going to load it. 
setting layer one at uh, 70, denoise value of 20, and then layers two through six I have here set at 20. And you can see in this area where it has already applied the sharpening. Um, go out to full image and do all, and it's going to go and process the entire um, field of view. Zoom back in, you can see how nice it's cleaned up. And we'll go ahead and save. And now I'll show you the full image. Okay, now I have the image into Photoshop. And you can see here there's some uh, jagged edges uh, that you get. Uh, that's an artifact from stacking. Um, we're going to crop that out. But what I do first is grayscale mode, into adjustments, levels. Push this slider up, and then I use the first slider here, and I eliminate some of the um, extra noise that would be uh, injected into the image. This is more noticeable when you're looking near the limb and you see the black space uh, beyond. There'll be some some unwanted noise and whatnot in there, but this would remove that. This also gives it a little better uh, dynamic range or more contrast. Um, in my opinion. Next thing would be to crop, and we're going to remove these areas here where the, the data is a little jagged. Let's recenter what we have in the field of view. Just real quickly crop. Uh, next thing I do would be to go to camera rough filter. down here to the texture settings, uh, push this up. I'll go all the way to 100% so you can see what this slider does to the image. I just kind of eyeball it. I don't like to overcook anything. Same thing for clarity. See what that does. And a little bit of dehaze. And I'll go to the max so you can see what it does to the background image. You just don't go more than a few clicks. Now raise the black levels, Just eyeball it as I go, be all the way up, push a little bit of the shadows, a little increase in the contrast, not too much. I don't mess with the exposure level here, there's another area to do that. So you see now it's applied those, so now the textures and the surrounding uh, surface here really have been brought out. You can see you know, some ejector patterns and the different uh, different variations in the uh, the Maria here. This is Maria Fragoris. Real quick, I go to noise, do a noise reduction. Just kind of play with the strength here. You don't want to take out too much of your data. Um, go to level two. 90% preserved details. And this is important, remove the JPEG artifact. And it pulls out some unwanted noise that you see if you zoom it in. Uh, you can also do an additional very mild sharpen, a smart sharpen. Um, you can fiddle with the radius size here and you'll see what it does to the image if you overdo it. See, it's getting very coarse, very overcooked. I usually don't do, you know, maybe 3.3, 0.4, just very, very mild to kind of bring back some sharpness that the um, noise reduction has taken out. Let that apply real quick. And then come back to adjustments. And here's where I mess with the exposure if need be. Uh, gamma is usually very helpful so you can get the right illumination levels. I go for visual effect offset. Usually, I bump it down one or two clicks. And if you want to mess with the exposure, here's where you do. But I, I like the way this looks now, so I'll leave it there and save the image.
can now show you the full image. All right, now let me just uh, exit out of this real quick. Yep. So what'd you think of that? Well, that was great. Yeah, I could really see, I think uh, Randy had mentioned uh, the other day, he's like, man, you can really see the, the Plato craterlets and uh, Rime Plato and uh, Vallis Alps, you could re uh, resolve uh, the valley there. So those are Plato Craterlets is another one of the Lunar 100 targets. So yeah, I've just been on a mission to, um, to get that, uh, finish that project. I started it some time back um, in, in the Selenology group. Um, I tried to get a group effort going to where, you know, we could do, do all those 100 as a group, but I just, uh, I decided to take it on myself just because maybe I'm insane, <laughs> but, uh, it, it keeps me focused. Um, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are kind of, uh, still distant early this in the season. So I, I decided I was going to focus on, uh, and finish up that, uh, that lunar 100. So I'm probably maybe 60 to, to 65 percent completed with that um, so now i'm just trying to do some planning to get uh, to get the rest of those done so uh, what i'd like to do now briefly is just show you some other images um, that i've taken that's not what i want to bring up here um, first, can i ask photos. a question of you yes yeah, sure oh just if you had if you if you wanted to make a colored image using the same technique do you, do you combine them in the auto stackers part? Um, I personally, I don't, uh, I, I used to shoot uh, color images of the moon uh, when I first started uh, doing planetary imaging. Um, and then I, through experience, learned uh, that, you know, the resolution is just so much better uh, with the monochrome camera. I know there, there are a number of people that like uh, shooting uh, color images. I mean, there are some variations, uh, you know, in the soils, uh, you know, and, and surface features. Um, and some people really like to go crazy in Photoshop and just push the saturation, you know, yeah. to, to ridiculous levels. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't find that appealing. Um, I know people like to do it. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there, you know, it reminds me of uh, in the old encyclopedias where you would turn to the, you know, the human body and you can turn the pages and look at different layers in the body. And they were like really vivid colors. <laughs> it reminds me, it reminds me of that. But uh, I mean, there's, I, I'm a fan of nothing in excess, you know, um, less is more, you know, with sharpening, with, with saturation. But the, I mean, there, there are a few guys in my group that just take some stunning, stunning color images of the moon. And, and I applaud them for that. But just my, my personal choice is uh, I usually use a green filter if seeing is really good because it helps with ghosting. Like in this image on the screen here, uh, was this Conan crater here. Um, with red uh, and sometimes even IR, uh, you get that little ghost thing that goes on here. The green filter really helps to uh, eliminate that. I think this picture I have up on the screen is, um, uh, this might be uh, IR, either IR650 or IR742, uh, which, um, you know, helps. Uh, th those longer wavelengths are less affected uh, by C. So. Yeah. Did, did that answer your question? I mean, some people do overlay. They'll take a color image and then kind of overlay it. Um, I don't know if they do that in Auto Stacker. Uh, it might be something maybe uh, in Photoshop or, or maybe PIP. Um, I don't I haven't used that yet. Some friends of mine told me I should use it because you don't have to pay for it like Photoshop. <laughs> but I signed up for the it's like nine ninety nine a month, so you always have the, the most recent version of uh, Photoshop available. But uh, yeah, this picture here, this is uh, L four, the Apennines. 
Um, you can see up here, I think this is what remade Fresno. Um, uh, you can see, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, what is this here? Um, my mind just went blank. The uh, Hadley Rail here. Hadley Rail. That's it. Jeez, Hadley thank you, Rail. And uh, Apollo 15 is kind of hidden here in this shadow, which is coming off of Mount Hadley. Um, I think what the, the highest peak is uh, what Mons Huygens, which I think is right around this right, this peak right here, <clears throat> uh, upwards of like eighteen thousand, around eighteen thousand feet. Uh, but this is just such a dramatic uh, area to, to image, and then what I and these shadows they move, you know, as as the lunar day progresses. So. <clears throat> I've done in the past and, and I want to do it again. I think on Plato, because uh, you get the shadows, especially on Plato, it looks like a skyline, you know, and, and, and they move with the, with the passage of, uh, you know, the moon and, and the angles of the sun changing and, and do a, a big sequence of images like that and then do it in a video and you actually see the shadows shrink or extend. So that's a lot of work, but it's, it's very rewarding uh, to do that. Uh, here's uh, Mare Crisium. Uh, this is uh, L10. <clears throat> and then uh, somewhere right around, I think, in this area here is Horseshoe Crater, which we'll get to uh, uh, shortly. But I think this was one of the first images I took when I got that 11-inch SCT. And um, I actually showed this uh, picture to uh, Fred Hayes from, uh, you know, he was on Apollo 13. And he, he really enjoyed this image. And he said, you know, that reminds me of the Sea of Moscow, which is on the far side of the moon. And I said, well, I'll take your word on that since you've seen it. <laughs> but that I was a real treat. That this is uh, pretty much the illumination we'll get tonight. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's been really cloudy here. So, I mean, there, the moon doesn't exist for me, at least until these clouds go away. Uh, next, uh, that was uh, Mari Crisium here. Uh, here's the Bay of Rainbows, uh, you know, Sinus Iridum. Um, and the, uh, this feature here, um, the, uh, I guess, uh, Laplace Promontory, uh, this has always just amazed me. And, and this shadow is, that's probably at least 30 miles. I mean, this is what, 160 miles or so across here. Um, and this has always, appeared to me like a lunar sundial because this, this shadow will shrink and then it'll transition and it'll point out in this direction. So, uh, but this is always, uh, and this area has always fascinated me. You know, this, this crater is on an angle, I guess, and it was encroached with lava. So you just get this nice big, um, you know, this nice big crescent here. So, um, and then this is what uh, Montes, Montes uh, Recti, the, the straight, straight mountain, the straight range or whatever they call it here. This is always is a nice feature to, to bring out. And these wrinkle ridges here. Um, I, I, I love wrinkle ridges when you get them with very, very shallow or, uh, you know, long uh, angles of sunlight, they just stand out. Very impressive. Uh, the straight wall here, uh, this is uh, what L, L15 Rupes uh, Erecta. It's about, um, that's about uh, 62, 63 miles, 100 kilometers. Um, very, very interesting feature. And uh, just don't, you don't want to drive over that in a rover. <laughs> that would be, that would be uh, not good. Uh, here's another. Uh, this is uh, L46, uh, Regio Montanus, um, the central peak, which is here. Let me zoom this in a little bit. Uh, if it'll let me, I have all my, my sharing stuff in the way here. Oops, that was not what I wanted to do. Let me zoom it in a little bit. Uh, here's the central peak here. <clears throat> and I guess uh, for some time, this was thought to be a volcano, uh, but that's just a, a choice impact crater right here on, on the central peak. And it's not really central anymore because this crater has encroached on it. So I mean, this you know, some feature out here in the crater, but uh, I just, I'm a Terminator junkie. I mean, look at this shadow here. This, that's, I, I just, I, I can sit and just sit in awe and, and follow the Terminator up and down. Um, uh, Lamont here, uh, L53, 
again, uh, the long shadows catching it. You know, this is, uh, I guess, the ghostly remnants of an ancient crater that's been uh, subsequently uh, subject to lava flows. Um, very, very cool looking um, feature in, uh, near the Terminator. Apollo 11 is up uh, around in this area, this general area here. Um, this is one of my favorites. Do you have the resolution? You have the resolution to see uh, the the three craters: Armstrong, uh, Aldrin, and um... Collins. Yes, yes, I do. I have that. Um, if I can find it uh, at some point, I can bring that up. But I do have that one. Um, yeah, I usually have to go to a three X borrow. But yeah, I do have those three craters. Um, actually, those are one of the lunar um, one hundred features. Um, but uh, yeah, this, uh, this, this is just impressive here. And you can even notice the, the, notice the different dichotomy here between the two, the two uh, lava flows, lighter and darker. It's prominent, you know, prominent right through here. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is uh, the Schiller Zuckius Basin. You know, here's Schiller Crater, Zuckius Crater. And notice the internal, the concentric ring inside and outside, this was just choice uh, lighting for this feature. When, the, when it's overhead, you really can't hardly make out the outer edge uh, of this feature. It's, I think, um, 200, you know, just a little over 200 miles across. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I also rotate images for, for visual effect too. I know a lot of people, they're real sticklers for north is up, darn it, you know, especially the guys in the IAU. But I, I rotate images to get the, you know, just to get the little wow factor out of them and, and to get the, the feel as though you're in a spacecraft, you know, coming in for a landing. So uh, another really cool feature here, um, here's Kai's crater, which has always reminded me of a paintball splat. Back to my paintball day, it looks like it's, you know, the paint dripping here. But right there, there's uh, the lunar dome. Uh, I think that's what's maybe six, seven miles across. Um, and the, the elevation around 500 feet, I think. Uh, so you need, you know, very steep angles, you know, long angles of sunlight to bring that out. Uh, and the caldera is less than a mile, like three quarters of a mile, maybe eight tenths of a mile in diameter. So that's, that's a really cool feature to find. Uh, Patatas crater over here. Um, what else do I have? Um, and I just asked, there was a question for you, Gary. Um, which lunar atlas do you favor? Um, well, I have um, the, the one that, that Chuck Wood wrote, co-wrote with, um, with Maurice Collins. I have it here on the bookshelf behind me. And uh, according to Chuck, I have the only copy of that book on the planet that both authors have signed. Uh, I met with I, I met with Chuck uh, up in Wheeling, West Virginia, when uh, when I was my mom was still around, and uh, my brothers and I went to visit with him one day. Um, and that's that was right after he decided that he was going to end the LPOD that he had done for a number of years. And I met with him, and I. I I asked him, you know, could I carry the torch and I'd like to create a group on Facebook um, to kind of, you know, continue in the tradition of what you do. And he was very receptive to that. So I basically got his blessing uh, on that. And he's in the group. Um, Brian is in the group. We've got a number of uh, amazing uh, lunar imagers in the group. And um, I think Brian will have a little uh, a little uh, tidbit he's going to maybe talk about briefly um, uh, that that group is going to be potentially uh, associated with the Viper mission that's coming up. Uh, but this image here, this is Reiner Gamma. Um, I fiddled with uh, you know the, the texture settings and, and the uh, and the gamma settings to really bring out uh, this feature. This is just amazing. Um, and then over here, uh, we have, uh, what is it, uh, Cardanus Crater and Craft Crater, and then the Catena Craft here, which is, uh, what, about a 60-mile or so series of little uh, impacts, which is like a bridge between these two craters. Um, 
what else do I have here? There's my scope again. I wanted to go, let me go back. Um, I'll show you the other uh, image. Um, there it is. This is my Clavius and, you know, Maurice's crater over here. I think this is, uh, uh, what, Klaproth or Klaplot, um, Cabeus crater here. Um, I think this might be the M1 peak, if I'm not mistaken, or is it this one back here? But this is, you know, the southern polar region, um, um, you know, with Artemis going to be going to the south pole. So this images of this nature uh, are very appealing to me. Um, I just, I like looking at the, you know, limb uh, shots along the lunar limb too, because you can really get, I mean, look at this valley that runs through here and you, you get the feel for the, the ruggedness of the terrain, you know, imagine flying in and coming in, you know, going to land maybe right here in this crater. Uh, but there is uh, another image, this one right here. I think I showed it to you guys earlier. This, uh, Brian challenged me to get this picture. Uh, this is Horseshoe Crater in Mare Crisium, and I kind of blew it up here. Um, and then on that note, I will hand it over to Brian and let him explain um, what transpired with this image, which uh, I'm still pinching myself today <laughs> as to what happened with this image. Okay. So I'll need you to stop sharing, Gary. Yep, and okay. Let me stop share. There you go. I will attempt to share. And... Okay, so here we have a completely different view of Horseshoe Crater. Uh, hoping you can see it here just below center in my screen. And this is a, a breached cinder cone. So you can see this is not an impact crater. This is actually a volcanic feature. Um, and this is of particular interest because this is a site in Mare Crisium that we are planning to visit in 2023 three as part of the commercial lunar payload services program where NASA is actually buying rides on commercial uh, lunar transport services to uh, go to a variety of places on the moon. And uh, this area came up and I was talking to the folks at NASA headquarters and the folks uh, with, uh, in this case, this is Firefly Aerospace that is going to be flying here. And uh, uh, we were talking about the landing site and it's a very arcane feature. Nobody typically has ever heard of it. Uh, I think Horseshoe Crater got its name fairly recently because of its shape, but uh, I had never heard of an amateur astronomer actually seeing it or imaging it. And so I tossed it out there to Gary and his group. And uh, sure enough, Gary got a wonderful image of it. And I shared that with the folks at NASA headquarters and at Firefly, and they were really excited. Um, this is clearly not a terrestrial view. This is a view from the Moon Trek data visualization and analysis portal that my group at NASA produces. So we have this online tool that was created for analyzing lunar data originally for the purposes of mission planning and lunar science, but it also turns out to be a great outreach and education tool. And I think it is an outstanding tool for amateur astronomers and all lovers of the moon. So let me go through a little bit of how it works. It's essentially a uh, GIS system for the moon and we have 
like any good GIS system, you can pan, you can zoom. And so here we'll zoom down to the crater. And uh, one of the things you might want to know is, well, how big is it? And that's very easy to determine. You can just draw a line across a feature and measure its distance. We can also figure out how high it is. So again, we will draw a line. This time we'll calculate an elevation profile. So let's draw a line. We'll extend it to either side like so. Come on, you can do it. There we go. And here you can see the actual, you can measure the heights of peaks, the depths of craters. And so, you know, when Gary's talking about looking at something like the Keys Pie Dome, if you want to measure the size of it or measure the slope of the lunar straight wall, we have tools that allow you to do that. Similarly, uh, one fun feature is you can draw a bounding box around any feature that you like and it will generate either an STL or OBJ file for you. And if you have a 3D printer, you can then make a 3D print of whatever terrain you like. Um, I've got an example here. This is a 3D print uh, generated of the lunar south pole. I'm hoping you can see that. Um, so that's a fun feature. Um, another useful feature is being able to um, draw a path anywhere you want across the surface and it will come back to you with a QR code. You scan this QR code into your smartphone, put your smartphone in a pair of cheap $5 Google compatible cardboard goggles and whatever path you drew, you will now fly in virtual reality. So that's also a fun feature. Um, we have different projection modes. So we can go into a 3D mode where we can actually uh, actually interactively fly across the surface. So this is a wonderful way to go exploring. Uh, people asked about finding your way around the moon. One of the things you can do is you can type in the name of either any feature and fly to it. You can, so uh, you can also turn on a nomenclature layer to show you the names of features. So this is essentially uh, an online atlas of the moon and it's highly interactive. But the real, one of the real powers of this comes from the fact that it allows you to view the surface of the moon as seen through the eyes of many different instruments aboard many different spacecraft. So here I'm zooming into the South Pole and here we can see that the South Pole has very, very harsh shadows, deeply shadowed, but we can pierce those shadows by going to, uh, it turns out we've got thousands of different data layers that are available. And so I've preloaded a few here. So here I'm gonna switch to a laser altimetry view that allows us to pierce those shadows and see those darkened floors. We can also do a slope map view. This is very useful if you were planning a traverse. Here I'm going to overlay the permanently shadowed areas. These are areas where we think we may have accumulations of volatiles such as ice, water ice and other 
interesting ices. Um, surface temperature, this is average surface temperature. And we can see there's a, you can toggle a legend there to see what the co different colors mean. We have uh, maximum surface temperature. We can, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit here and we can take a look at uh, neutron spectrometry to see the presence of hydrogen probably indicating where we might have deposits of water and even look at things like ice stability at depth. So how far down would you have to dig in order to find ice actually remaining stable? And in cases of these permanently shadowed areas, you probably don't have to dig at all. It's just right on the surface. So as we take a look at the South Pole, I'm gonna switch our view here to 3D globe. Um, and I'm gonna zoom out. Um, as we take a look at the South Pole, we're getting ready for the upcoming Viper mission to the moon. And that is going to be a rover that is going to be launched to the South Pole of the moon in 2023 ideally November of 2023. And what we are hoping to do is have uh, people here on earth, imagers, amateur imagers, very intently during the period of operations of the Viper rover as it wanders the, course, the south pole of the moon looking for deposits of water ice, it's prospecting for water ice. In these very, very intense, harsh lighting conditions, we would like to have our expert amateur community here imaging the South Pole as seen from here on Earth and documenting the changes in lighting uh, from this vantage as we see it from a completely different vantage at the same time on the moon. So we're looking forward to working with the community uh, as we conduct the Viper mission coming up very soon. But between now and then we have a number of other missions that are going. We talked about going to Mare Crisium. Another place we're going is to Locus Mortis. So I'll go ahead and Type in Locus Mortis here, and let's go ahead and fly there. And th we're planning to go to Locus Mortis actually within the next few months. And the nice thing, one of the really nice things about Moon Trek is as an observer of the moon, it can help you plan your observations, look for really challenging objects but it can also help you interpret what you are seeing in your images. So as we look at this large area here of Locus Mortis and we see the crater Berg uh, within Locus Mortis and we notice this great landslide coming down uh, from the Western rim of Berg. We see the rills, the Rime Berg, and these are fractures in the crust that have actually been pried open by magma welling up from beneath and causing rifts that here on earth we call graben. Uh, they take the form of valleys for the most part, but then we see an interesting transition in the case of one of these where this particular rill actually transitions to, uh, I'm gonna switch our view a little bit, transitions from being a valley to being uh, a fault scarp, very similar to the straight wall. So again, I can show how we can, uh, let's do an elevation profile and we'll do an elevation profile here and we should see that 
it is in fact, you see this kind of valley like, but now if we draw another one, down here, we'll see how this has made a transition to being a fault scarp. And you just have this step up, very interesting. And uh, since Gary did so well with uh, the horseshoe crater challenge, I'm gonna throw out a really probably ridiculous one. <laughs> But right here, and I've never seen any amateurs come close to imaging it, you have a pair of volcanic domes you can see right here along one of the Rime Berg. So these two volcanoes, these are small. Uh, let's, let's measure how big they are. Uh, so we'll draw a line across here. So we're talking about they're you know three and a half kilometers, oh, so man. yeah, <laughs> you, you you're paying the price of being so darn good, Gary. I keep going to keep making it harder, but uh, um, challenge, you know, challenge accepted. All right, so um, <laughs> but as we start conducting our upcoming explorations of the moon. And they're going to be coming fast and furious. We're looking at, you know, at least two landings a year uh, at a pace coming up very soon. Um, it's going to be fascinating to follow these adventures and to really help explore this. We're actually uh, looking at the potential of crowdsourcing some of the upcoming rover traverse paths. So. This will be an opportunity, people using the uh, Moontrack portal and a future tool that we're going to have for traverse planning, uh, people will be able to take a look at areas of interest and propose traverse paths. And uh, you can actually play an integral role in the planning of our upcoming exploration of the moon. I'm going to wrap up with just a... Uh, Quick, uh, I'm going to, to get to this, and I should mention again, this is all browser-based. You don't install anything, you don't buy anything, you just go to trek.nasa.gov and run this on your browser uh, and we have, in addition to the moon, we have portals for Mars, Mercury, Europa, seven of uh, Saturn's smaller moons, our moon, Titan, the asteroids Bennu, Ceres, Ryugu, Vesta, and more things to come. So uh, you can explore the moon as well as other worlds of our solar system using the NASA solar system tracks. Thank you very much. Wow. Yeah, wow is all you can say. Like, that's pretty well. I have a question for Gary. This is another Gary here. What kind of native seeing do you have there? And what focal, what's your overall focal length? Um, my, my bordel is, is high. I think it's, uh, what, like maybe uh, seven. I mean, the light pollution here is, is horrendous. Um, but, you know, planetary, uh, you know, targets are very, uh, you know, very bright. They, uh, they cut through a lot of this stuff, you know, um, um, you know, Jupiter, uh, one of my favorite things, just to, sometimes I'll just watch, you know, uh, I'll just put my camera in and I use it like as a digital eyepiece and I'll just sit there and, and marvel at it. Um, um, planetary rotations are fun to do as well. Um, but the scene conditions here are usually um, pretty good. Um, you know, obviously not, not lately. It's been, we've been getting inundated with rain here, um, rapidly coming out of our drought. But, um, you know, sometimes even the humidity uh, helps uh, with the scene conditions as well. And that's when I'll shoot uh, 
you know, an, an infrared, uh, like a lot of times uh, 742 nanometer, which is what, just outside the visual range. I think the, the human eye can see what to like 740. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of good from that to what you can, um, you know, shoot in less than desirable scene. Um, but did I did I forget something out of your question? Oh, first of all, what how, what kind of give me an arc second figure of what your typical seeing is like? Where I image in Arizona, we're lucky to get two and a half arc seconds. Lucky. Wow. How about you? Um, I would have to to check that. That's not something I really have measured yet. But uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know there's some people that are really into those those figures. I mean I, I could look it up for you and you know calculate and see what I get. But uh, I'm usually just so excited to get out there and do imaging. Um, but my um, you know the uh, my my 11 inch um, looks like 20. 24 23 something um focal length you know so now with the the 2x and the 3x barlow you know i'm up in the 4000 you know maybe 6000 millimeter focal length um but it's all seeing based as well so when i when i did that image of horseshoe crater it, the seeing was a little questionable um but i i dropped the 3x barlow in and i went for it um, i waited like i think two and a half lunar cycles before i finally was able to see it the Terminator and scene just finally collided uh, in one evening and, and I went for it and I got it. Yeah, it, so, it looks like you have no atmosphere above you, quite frankly. They're so good. Like, seriously, oh, they're, they're amazing. Thank you. I was just curious what your scene was. Yeah. And the portal that you showed us was awesome as well. Like, wow. How do you decide what to look at? There's so much there, you know? Yeah, the, the moon provides just such a wealth of wonders. And, you know, using something like Moon Trek, I will sometimes, you know, at the end of the day, I'll pop open a cold one and just go flying <laughs> and just go flying across the surface. And it is really not hard to discover something you have just never seen before. And it's Oh my God, look at that. What in the world am I seeing here? What, what story is it telling me? And, uh, you know, I'll stare at it and look at it for a while and scratch my head and get more and more excited about it. And then I'll think, okay, I wonder if it can be seen from here on earth. And that's when, uh, I ask Gary to pop open a cold one as I, uh, throw another challenge at him. Lunar 101. Yeah. Yeah, Brian and I uh, exchange messages um, often, you know, and then I'm kind of tickled when my phone will ring, I'll look at it and it'll say, Brian Day, NASA. And I'm like, do you get these calls? <laughs> but uh, we do a lot of brainstorming on things. So um, Brian is, is becoming um, uh, an amazing friend to have. Um, we got a lot of things in common, and uh, I guess we're geeks uh, when it comes to the moon and, and things of astronomy nature. So, uh, very cool. What's the difference between lunar processing and deep space processing? Equipment and and yeah. And they're two completely different ball games. Uh, you know, with uh, with planetary, you can get away with using you know alt azimuth mounts as, as both of. Uh, well, I have three scopes, but I have uh, my CPC eleven hundred. Also have the uh, CPC eight hundred, but um, uh, you know field rotation comes into play there. So, but uh, deep space, um, I just never got the bug. Uh, to be honest with you, I mean, I have several friends. Um, uh, Charles Lilo is one he's, he's actually doing, um, uh, uh, he and Jason do the AAPOD2 site, uh, which I've been honored to have a couple of those, uh, to my, to my name as well. Um, they just, you know, your you, you, equatorial mount, uh, different, uh, imaging, uh, hardware, uh, different imaging cameras. I mean, planetary, uh, typically you want a smaller imaging chip. Uh, smaller pixel size, uh, deep space is the other way around. You want bigger, you know, full frame chips, uh, larger pixel size. Um, and you, you're doing hours, hours long exposures and hours and hours of multiple exposures where, you know, planetary, uh, like Jupiter, for instance, I'll do a two minute capture and I'm 
you know, maybe between eight to 12 milliseconds exposure and I'll capture for you know, maybe two minutes and I'll have, you know, 10, 12,000 frames and maybe keep, uh, you know, 30, 40% of those just to do a Jupiter image. So it, it's just, uh, it's, it's a different pond and that's the one I like to swim in. Um, maybe uh, one day I'll get, uh, I'll get the bug and get the right equipment to do deep space. But Prima Lucha Lab uh, is coming out in September with uh, a device uh, called Arco, the arc second uh, uh, field rotation. And that is going to really open up some doors. Um, you know, you, you rotate the field of view. And then once you get that automated, now in theory, uh, you know, my alt as uh, setup is going to have the benefits of being an equatorial mount. So I like that because now I don't have to take Jupiter and the wind jupos and do all the, you know, the derotation from, uh, you know, to, 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 to do multiple stacks of images to get better image quality. So I'm really excited about that. I think that's going to be available in early September. Uh, so. Gary, um, since you're doing planetary and lunar, uh, is the Altera camera that you're using, is it cooled or you just don't bother? Uh, it is cooled. Um, I, I usually leave the fan on. Um, one thing I have learned recently um, is cooled cameras, uh, they last longer, you know. Um, you're, you know, mean time between failure with anything electronic. So if you, if you have a cooling fan, um, it's very beneficial to extend the life uh, of the electronics. So, but yeah, I picked up that camera from Nick uh, at Altair. Um, I wanted to try it out. And I've been using the heck out of it uh, since I got it. I also have their GP cam, I think the 130 uh, V2 GP cam, which is a USB 2 camera. Uh, but uh, I like, I like the, uh, the super speed cameras, you know, the USB 3. Um, and I'll probably get some other, I mean, I just recently, I think the most recent camera I got was the QHY 462C. You know, it's a color camera very high uh, quantum efficiency. And I'm looking forward to really going after Jupiter and Saturn uh, with that camera uh, this season. So yeah, cool, cooling is cooling is, uh, is cool. <laughs> Turn it on if you have it. Hi there. Um, my question is for Brian Day. Um, Brian, I, I messaged you, you that I'd gone to your talks in Hawaii when I volunteered there for astronomy. Some people in the group know that I've done that. And, but I wondered if you might uh, tell our group, because they were so suitably impressed about Moontrack, uh, about uh, an aspect of research that I learned about from you, um, and that's the Lunar Sample and Meteorite Lending Program that is a way for people across, the, educators across the United States to have access to these priceless treasures. Um, I hope that's on topic. It is about outreach and, and the moon. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Um, this is a program that we make available to educators, K-12 educators throughout the United States. Uh, I'm afraid we don't ship to Canada, unfortunately, on this one, but I can, I can get back to you with a, an alternative. Um, one of the things that we do is we have, of course, a number of samples from the Apollo missions, as well as we have some interesting meteoritic samples at our astromaterials branch at uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. And a number of the Apollo samples have been set into uh, these clear plastic discs that enable safe examination of the samples. And each disc contains a sample of lunar basalt, uh, lunar anorthosite, uh, a lunar breccia, so three different types of rock, and then three different types of soil, mare soil, highland soil, as well as some of the exotic orange soil that was collected from the Apollo 17 mission. And those are actually little beads of volcanic glass. And so, teachers can actually go through certification workshops and learn how they can actually borrow these Apollo samples 
to bring into their classrooms, which is a really wonderful, exciting experience for the kids to be able to actually firsthand examine these precious rocks from the moon. Now, something else we've been doing is um, working with some more accessible lunar samples. And we've actually produced, I'm, um, uh, gee, I wish I had it right next to me right now, but we've got uh, these touchable moon rock exhibits that we have put together through my institution, SERVI, the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. Way too long a name. But here we take actual pieces of meteoritic moon rock moon rock that has been blasted off the surface of the moon by meteorite impacts and has fallen to earth. And because we have additional samples of moon rock that we have brought back, we can do the comparison. And we know in fact, these are, these are actual moon rocks. And so those are far less restrictive. And uh, we've come up with a nice way of mounting them in a uh, protective display and so people can reach in. I, we've designed it so basically you've got a magnifying lens on top. You can get your, we designed it so that you can get your finger in to touch it but not your tongue. Um, I've seen too many of these touchable moon rocks with people licking them and I just didn't want to go there. So, um, but uh, if you're interested, if you have institutions in Canada that might want to have a touchable moon rock, um, I can work with you on uh, how, how that could possibly be done. And I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Gary's showing off something there. Oh, uh, yes. That is a piece of the moon, uh, one of those ejecta rocks. Um, but I got for my birthday last year by my good friend, Brian Day. You guys are a team. <laughs> uh, so, so Brian, there's a question from Peter. Is there currently or are there plans in the future for a satellite that provides live views of the moon, similar to what the SOHO spacecraft does for the sun? Uh, it's something I was actually in some discussions today. Uh, I'll just say that um, right now we don't have um, a lunar orbiter actually on the books for that. Uh, but one of the things I would like to do eventually is have something similar to if you're familiar with the Juno cam, which is currently on the Juno spacecraft and you have amateur astronomers or amateurs or citizen scientists actually making proposals of where the camera should point and then gathering that data and then citizen scientists processing the data. It's really a remarkably successful program. And I would ideally, in some way, like to see something similar with a ground-based camera on the moon. And so I am in the early stages of trying to figure out exactly how we might do that. And, you know, a really interesting place to put it. And then having the citizen science community actually directing that camera, getting data, processing data, and looking at the lunar geomorphology and how our perception of it changes with changing lighting. So stay tuned. If anything works out, I'll be happy to report back. I'd like to add, Peter, that there is a virtual version of that because um, NASA has the Science Visualization Studio, which I use almost every day mm -hmm. and my uh, observing. So you look up uh, svs.gsfc.nasa.gov and they, they have this thing called the uh, dial moon where you put in the date and time and 
it works out all the libration and the the solar angles and uh you know exactly where uh you're going to be able to to see features brian do, is it possible to change the solar the illumination in moon trek so we have um different levels of tools so i showed you the generally available tools there's also account level access for the more computationally intensive tools. And those typically are we reserve for people who have good research or planning reasons, but they include ray traced lighting analysis. And so one of the things you can do is you define a bounding box, very similar to what we did for generating the 3D print. And then you can specify a beginning date and time an end date and time and step intervals in between and it will generate a lighting analysis for that and each lighting analysis will actually include an image a ray traced image that then is put together into a movie and so you can actually watch the lighting change over that period of time uh, it also provides maps of watts per square meter so if you're planning a traverse with a solar powered uh, rover, uh, that could be some really valuable information to have. So um, yes, we do do pretty high end lighting analysis, but again, that is because that is all ray traced uh, and we, you can take into effect, not just the solar illumination, but lighting coming from the earth. You can take reflective lighting coming from landforms you know, mountain peaks that might be around. It is not at all, it is definitely an asynchronous process. You submit something and then you will get an email response later with your job, but it is not something that runs instantaneously. It is very intensive. But I will point out that, and I will second your, uh, your point about dial -a moon for ground-based vantage point dial -a moon is something i use all the time to look at you know what is going to be visible on a given night what is going to uh you know from a both a libration standpoint and a lighting standpoint it is a remarkable tool um ernie wright at goddard puts that together and he does a just, it's a magnificent tool. I for one would like to see uh, a nice big scope on the South Pole of the moon that uh, that you can get time on and, and do imaging from, yep. from the moon. And uh, I'll, I'll even go set it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really like before we finish with uh, the moon stuff i i'd love to have mike show off his equipment because you've been showing us these pictures and i'm fascinated at how you can get that sort of resolution and also you're you're doing these daytime photos these days i even challenged you yesterday to do one and you pulled one off well i i i, I couldn't see it but i my camera found it yes uh <laughs> <laughs> the three percent is in the middle of the day is is not nothing my eyes are ever going to find <laughs> so can you show off what you've got because it blows me away i haven't actually sorted out this whole sharing thing yet but but i mean if you if you if you take um you know what what gary was showing us earlier and shrink that by about you know 50 percent, that's kind of what my stuff might look like <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I mean, I use a big refractor, um, and I, for me, big anyway, I, I, I use a 140 millimeter um, APM, um, and that's the one that I do all, you know, all the, the, the usually the mosaics and the, the full, the full moon shots, and then I'm trying to enter into Gary's, you know, domain and territory of high res, and and I'm working with. Uh, Right now, a seven-inch Mac and an eight-inch 
uh, maxi tub, um, debating on which one I'm going to keep. And uh, I'm still not there. I, I, the the uh, I, I the whole the whole um, you know the close ups are are something that are still quite challenging. I've, I've got to work out whether it's you know I, I'm at my seeing limits or whether maybe I can go a little bit bigger, get closer to that 11 inch you've got, Gary. <laughs> Aperture and focal length is where it's at. Yeah. And seeing. And seeing. Yeah. <laughs> but when you do your daytime shots, uh, do you use infrared? Which I yeah. think. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I I have got I've got three, well, four, uh, four filters that I that I shift between. I've got uh, um, a 685 NM and then uh, a 742 um, astronomic and then an 807 astronomic. And then an 850 from ZWO. Um, I don't find the 850 useful to me at all for anything. Um, the, the the 742 seems to like for daylight. Uh, I still get kind of a brightish gray sky, but it's it, there's enough of a contrast there that I can I can make it work. And 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 when I jump to an 807, it's just cutting out that extra little bit too much more too much signal. Um, and it, it, once it gets closer, closer to sunset, then I'll drop it down to like a 685, um, mm -hmm. or even down to a 610 if I can get away with it. But, but uh, I, I was amazed at the, the, uh, like you say, uh, Randy, I, I've been, I've been doing mostly daytime because just because of the seeing at night lately and, and where the moon's been and, and, uh, the late, you know, the late daytimes here, uh, you know, up north. Um, the only time that I could really image was in the daytime and I've been following this, uh, the seeing website. I can't remember the name of it now. And it started one day when I was sitting at home and it was a, you know, sunny day and I'm thinking about whether, well, I'll check and see if the moon's going to be up, you know, tonight and oh, well, no, but it's, the seeing is a five right now at two in the afternoon. And I, I, five out of five is what they were saying. And I thought, well, this is crazy. I've got to try it. And sure enough, it, I'm not going to say it was five out of five, but it was, it was well good enough for, for imaging. And uh, I've been thrilled with that because it's, it's probably doubled my imaging potential, you know, because uh, we're subject to where the moon is and where the seeing is and where the clouds are. And, and uh, it's, all too few times in a year that we we get to do what we love to do. So um, it's been fun. I'm kind of I, I'm really curious how far I can push resolution in daytime. Actually, so we'll see. One way to find out is that clear sky chart that you're using for this. That's yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I wish they had one for out here in Colwood, but I just have to make do with Victoria, which is you know I'm in Greater Victoria, but. It, it seems to be more accurate than most weather forecasts, so I'm happy about that anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think it's for, you know, things that are directly overhead. If you're looking down to some degree, you know, at a lower angle of altitude, it, it, they tend to get a little squirrely, um, but I use it as a baseline. So. Sure, and, that, and, and that's, that's all it can be, but it's, it's still been pretty good. I mean, I live in a valley, so I have to add that you know, to, to when I'm when I'm looking at the clear sky chart, it's not considering where I am really, but mm -hmm. but uh, I I've, it, it's definitely helpful. If it, if it says it's going to be a one or a two, then I I generally won't bother setting up. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. And sorry about the pictures, Randy, but I I'm I'm not set to to share my I I would, but I, I I'm not I'm not uh, on the. the don't know how to do the sharing thing here yet. We'll, we'll get you someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, are there more questions for, for our guests, Gary and Brian? Gary, it's uh, getting pretty late for you. Did you get your nap this afternoon? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll sleep uh, tonight, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually waking up around 5.30 anyway, so. Um... Yeah, if you call me tomorrow and I sound incoherent, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> going, going, gone. Uh, well, thank you so much. This has been a real treat. We uh, just appreciate your uh, 
experience and your presentations and I certainly am very excited. I sure would like to know, Peter Jedek uh, said we should, for inspiration, read a quote. Peter, are you able to get on the line and read it out loud? Are you there? Or are you just putting comments on? Well, he said thumbs up, so I think he's joining oh. us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. <laughs> there he is. I, ju I just had to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, so this is um, Bruce McCurdy's column in the uh, in the Observer's Handbook about lunar observing. And he starts off with a quote from Starlight Nights. I feel quite sure that I first viewed the moon in my small scope with just as much incredible delight as Galileo did in his. It is true that I had seen photographs of the moon and therefore had some vague idea of what its appearance would be like, but I was still wholly unprepared for all the wonders which I found on that first night as I explored the lunar surface. No photograph has yet been made which is not cold and flat and dead when compared with the scenes that meet one's eyes when the moon is viewed through even a small telescope. That, that's my good friend, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's funny because, I mean, obviously, Leslie Peltier favored actual visual observing, but you guys tonight have done an absolutely fabulous job of making me, you know, salivate about uh, imaging as well with the moon. Thank you so much. Welcome. I had the pleasure last night, we had dinner guests and I uh, pulled the telescope out and uh, one of them had never seen the craters of the moon before. So uh, that, that's one of the best outreach things. I know Bill loves to uh, be outside the cafe and, and just show people the moon. It's, uh, that first yeah. view is really very inspiring. To see that look on somebody's face when they see something for the first time. It's like the first time you looked in, in the eyepiece and saw Saturn. You, know, you could look at it in a photo, but when you see it in the eyepiece, you just have this epiphany. It's like, that's really there. And, and when Brian and I were at the, the Frost Museum in Miami for the Mercury Transit, you know, like I said before, we had probably close to 500 people waiting to come look through my telescope. And many of them have never done that before. And it was just, it hit me right here. So like, I'm watching these people, watching their face, and they're like, that little dot, that, that, that's Mercury. It's like very, very rewarding to, to give somebody you know, the ability to see something that they've never seen before. And you can't put words on it. Well, again, thank you. And now I think we'll put the, uh, the uh, floor to uh, David. Yeah, just something really quick. Um, uh, many of you probably know that I've been uh, wanting to sort of study variable stars and uh, probably for a long time. Uh, but uh, at the beginning of the year, I decided that I would uh, start this adventure and then looking at variables. So I originally started uh, thinking that I would do um, digital capture and do photometry. But uh, about a month and a half ago, I decided to uh, start at the beginning, like start with visual. And I actually, I'm quite glad uh, that I did. I just finished uh, constructing uh, a target list. Uh, and basically I'm telling you this mainly because uh, uh, I'm just starting this journey and I just wondered how many people would like to join me. Um, there's actually a whole program of studying variables just with binoculars. So the uh, equipment uh, uh, purchase is not really high to do this. And uh, there are actually plenty of stars that are bright enough that we can actually uh, observe them over time. Uh, using this time domain and do it with binoculars. So uh, if, if you are at all interested, just let me know. Uh, my uh, email address is on the SIG um, uh, page of uh, the website and just, just get a hold of me and let me know. Great. Chris, you going to... Uh... Pull it to the end. So should we, uh, yeah, should we have a look at um, the items that uh, Dave Robinson has shared with us or sent for us to have a look at? Excellent. Okay. Sure. They're, they're pretty quick, pretty quick. 
Yeah, let me just uh, make sure I'm in that mode. No, it never works when you do it that way. <laughs> so for you, lunar aficionados, this is a short video of the rise of the strawberry moon with some audio attached. And this, for our American friends, this is from 53 degrees north on the 24th of June. Yeah, so this is the city of Edmonton. That's magnificent. Yeah, Luca and uh, and uh, Alistair are are famous for doing these uh, lunar rise and lunar sets and sunrise and sunsets over the city of Edmonton. They have different locations scoped out for the perfect location to get the uh, background with the city in the foreground. Okay, let's see if we can. The, the yeah, next yeah. one is, <laughs> next one was forwarded from uh, an observer in Ottawa who is asking for anybody who has these kinds of uh, images to let him know. This particular image, uh, series of images were from the US Naval Observatory and it's what they call the Etruscan Bays or an Amiga effect. Now we get some atmospheric refraction stuff here over the sea, but uh, uh, this, is, this is kind of the extreme things that you can see with the sun. Ooh. Run through those again. I was on a sunset cruise in Key West, and I saw stuff like that. It was just it's timeless. Yeah, the, uh, the the real kicker is if you are fortunate enough to see the green flash. <laughs> yeah, we looked for it. It just didn't happen. It's I've seen photos of it. But... I, I saw it once in Hawaii. Uh, just as the sun was going down, we get the green flash, and right after the green flash, a humpback whale breached right in the same line of sight. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Anyway, this last one is uh, Abdur Anwar, and he is a, he is a really good astro, uh, planetary photographer. This is a uh, video of a uh, Jupiter and a little moon going in behind. Now, if you, if you have had the larger image and you had a chance to look at it, the resolution on that is absolutely terrific. Um, on, my, on my bucket list is to do that when the Earth is closer and further away from Jupiter and see to, if you can work out the speed of light the way that, uh, oh, who was it? Uh, Cassini's partner in Paris. So, so that, that image is at a, a Celestron Nexstar 8 SC and a uh, QHY 178C camera. Uh, and it's one and a half hours of, of uh, captures. That's it. I've done Jupiter uh, videos like that. I did uh, one where there was a dual shadow yeah. transit, and I got uh, that. They were the shadow was touching each limb, and that was. Uh, oh, if, if you guys uh, want to email me or reach out to me, I can share those uh, with you. Terrific. Good. Great. Anything else, Randy? That might be a game. Yeah. Well, there we are. And I just uh, point out to Gary that uh, for those people where you can see um, windows behind people, you'll just see it's just starting to get dark here. <laughs> <laughs> right at nine o'clock at night. So, yeah. yeah. The advantage I'm of living time. this far north in the summer. Yeah, I'm at 20, 26 degrees latitude here. I grew up near Pittsburgh, so I know yeah. a little bit of that. It was like in the 40 range, but uh, yeah. My wife has invited me for a quick stroll down to the beach before the, it gets too dark. Yeah. <laughs> and is tonight actually conjunction between Venus and Mar and uh, Moon? I think mm. it might be closest to yeah, I think, I think this is the closest point, uh, Randy. Yes, or, it is. Tonight, tonight is tonight. Yeah, yeah probably is tonight, yeah. 
Yeah. It's pretty low on the horizon though. Yeah, so we'll I was have to go. Oh. Yeah, I won't I won't see that from the beach tonight cuz the city kind of blocks that horizon. It, it, it's quite low. It's quite low. Yeah. Well, you're looking the wrong way from there too. <laughs> I did uh, actually get a nice shot of it last night Venus and Mars with the uh, crescent moon right next oh, to them. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I was I was wondering if somebody was going to catch that. Yeah, I got uh, that too last night as well. Yeah. It, it was really quite quite remarkable. Mount Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was interesting. Uh, I think it was uh, Mike uh, or um, the, the two pictures that you picked of Brian and myself. Um, <laughs> Just coincidentally, we are both on the, the Tachman telescope at Lick Observatory, not at the same time, but <laughs> that was that, that was an interesting coincidence. Yeah, I was actually up there last night. The Tachman still exists, though the fire burned right up next to it. Nice. That was the largest amateur uh, telescope when it was built in 37 or something I saw on the Wikipedia. Yeah, the night I was up there uh, was back in 2019. It was right after um, the Exploration Science Forum that Brian had invited me to, and uh, my friends uh, took me up there. I actually got to operate that telescope, and that was that was a timeless, uh, um, that'll be, I'll take that to my grave with me, uh, that experience. There's the picture. Yeah, nice. Venus and, and Moon. Who, who shared that? That's uh, Logan Grower. I got that last night off my deck. Nice. It was, uh, I took about 30 to get that one. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, As v you know. v Venus uh, is very prominent. M Mars is a little bit harder to see. Do you have v Mars as well? Um, no, actually. Yeah. Or maybe it's just hard to tell. It's hard to tell. I think they're really close together, but they this are. Is just they're from very close. my my digital SLR. So, yeah, but ni nice crescent. I can. I've got all three here. If uh, if I can share my screen, so let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, Okay, and here is, uh, uh, if you can see this, is this showing up oh, for I you? Oh, I see it. I see it. I see Mars. Yeah. So Very Mars, nice. Mars, and, uh, and then I think I've got, uh, let's see if this will show up. Uh, here's a closer view. And there you can see all three of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. Even a little bit of earth shine. Yep. Yeah, I took it last night out in uh, Colwood. Can I share that with you? Oh, yes. I'd like to see all of them. Sure. Okay, here we go. This is what I love best about Astro Cafe. <laughs> there, that was... Uh, Can you see oh, that? Wonderful. Oh, yeah, very nice. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Very nice. It was just um, cool. Perimeter Park just above the Squamalt Lagoon there. Mm -hmm. But as you said, David, getting Mars was just <laughs> really difficult. It's, 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 it's kind of difficult. And, and yeah. you're, you, you were smart to go to some place with a low horizon because yeah. it, is, it yeah. is tough if you have any hills. Yeah, it worked out really nicely. Yeah, very nice. Thank Lovely you. with the trees. And... Uh... As always tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I guess uh, I would just also, I know some people mentioned uh, Spiller observing a little bit earlier, and I'll put in a plug. Uh, Cycle 25 is starting to actually show some life to it. It's uh, the sun is becoming interesting again. And uh, I'd encourage people, let's see, I've got a, if I can, I've got a fairly recent image of, so there we go. 
Ah, uh, very nice. Yeah, beautiful. Well, it's, it is the sun is waking up. So, so Brian, uh, is this Brian? Is this the time to buy the solar scope? You know, uh, <laughs> yes. I've been. I bought mine several years ago, and uh, I've been waiting for it to start doing something <laughs> like this. You know, the the solar scope was not the. I mean, I'd. I'd pull it out for when the International Space Station flies across, but uh, <laughs> oh, I should, I should see if I've got that picture too. Hold on, just a second here. That, um, that looks like last Friday. Yeah, this yeah was, the problems look familiar. Yeah, so you, yeah, Thursday, so it's, Thursday or Friday, I can't remember which day. There was that little nub at about eight o'clock that was the naked eye sunspot and i recognize that little black spot next yeah, to yeah this is uh this was actually taken on june 28th okay so uh but yeah it's uh it's it's been uh it's been fun it's been active uh there's been a lot going on i don't know if i've got the uh yeah, I don't have the. You see if I've got real quick. Sun. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> so something got in the way. <laughs> but, Brian's loving that camera, aren't you? <laughs> I am. I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah, Gary. Uh, Gary gave me the imaging bug for uh lunar and planetary i was doing dslr stuff until uh, he got me to start getting a little more serious about it and i've been a quick, quick, quick one for you um i thought i was sharing the right screen here Let's uh, see if i can move this over one, one of my favorite saturn pictures Little storm going on right here. Not seeing it, Gary. What's that? I'm not seeing it. Yeah, we saw Saturn. Oh. Now there we go. There it is. There we go. Got on the wrong screen. Little little storm right here. It was uh, July uh, 2018, and now the the southern pole is now out below the uh, the rings now. So it's amazing to see how much over the years the tilt is changing. And that's going to be a fun uh, a photo to, to you know, show each year. I think Damien Peach has done several of those and they're impressive, impressive. I would like to flash back uh, to last year, actually, um, Comet Neowise. Um, this time last year, we were blown away with. And mm -hmm. uh, as it turns out, Deborah Saravalo has just put together a, a tribute to uh, the comet. And for those of you who know Deborah, you know she has some pretty impressive uh, equipment to work with on top of a mountain. And uh, she's uh, become a very talented uh, image processor as well. So. This is a little two minute, 51 second video of a, uh, her tribute. It's taken her all year to put this together as it turns out. Oh, wow. So let's see if I can get the uh, screen shared here. Okay, uh -huh. is everyone seeing? It's good. Yes. Okay. Um, you can see the shock waves coming off this, which is uh, spoiling the ending to the to the um, to the uh, video. But anyway, I'll play the video and I'll shut up. There's no sound, by the way, in case you're waiting for it.
This is taken from uh, the Okanagan in British Columbia. Noctilus and clouds are very rare in our southern latitude. Time lapse from her garden with some uh, aurora encroaching. That's beautiful. The town of Usui is off to the left. Some serious equipment. Yeah. Oh. But it allows her to do this. It's amazing. That's magnificent. Is she narrow banding or is that uh, full RGB? Um, she uses so much equipment, I better not answer the question. <laughs> You can even see the plumes coming out behind that. It's just incredible. Wow. There you go for the people who want all the techie stuff. <laughs> So she lives on uh, Anarchist Mountain, which is in Southern British Columbia. And her husband uh, makes uh, telescopic optics for a living. Joe, do you know if uh, some of this work that she did has been um, looked at like really scientifically? I don't know, you would have to ask her that. Um, this obviously is um, mainly pretty pictures, but as you say, there's a lot of value in there because of the, uh, all the resolution around the head of the comet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was impressive. It is. <laughs> hey, real quick. Um... Can you see this is uh, the dual transit and the, you see the shadow on each limb? Nice. Beautiful. Yeah, and this is, I animated this. This is like the first uh, middle and, and last frame in the sequence, but I also had this in video animation. But that right there, that was, I mean, for a shadow to be touching each limb, that's a, that lasted, I think, less than two minutes. Two and a half minutes tops, and I caught it. Gary, just... Gary, is this mono with filters or one one shot? Uh, that was uh, a color camera. I think this was probably my uh, ASI two ninety uh, MC uh, okay. CWO color camera. Yeah, or might even actually twenty seventeen. I don't know if I had the two ninety. This might be the the one twenty uh, MCS. Uh, and that was probably also through my eight inch um, Schmidt Cassegrain. I, mean, I didn't have my 11 inch yet. But yeah, that was that was a that was a timeless moment to see this and the GRS, you know, there. <laughs> so, just, yeah, uh, I, like, I, I totally understand what you're, you're saying, Gary. Uh, often when we look at Jupiter visually, often you'll see a, a moon just kind of hanging off of the edge like a nose, right? or mm -hmm. just starting to appear and grow until you actually see it. Yeah, one of my last outings, um, just not, not too long ago, I was watching, I think it was, um, it might have been Ganymede in Europa, and one moon um, just disappeared. It's like, oh, it went into the shadow of Jupiter. 
And it was like it was there one frame and the next frame I'm like, wait a minute, what happened? What happened to the screen here? Um, and then uh, I think uh, my friend Christopher Go um, caught one moon going into the shadow of another moon. Mm-hmm. And that was that was just like, whoa. <laughs> That Jupiter is so dynamic and so beautiful, you know. And when I look at Jupiter, sometimes I'll just sit there and I try to think, God, what was going through Galileo's mind when he was seeing this with a fraction of the aperture and the focal length that we take for granted now. But uh, that had to have been just, you know, such a major, major epiphany moment for him to you know, when he made that discovery that, hey, these things are going around Jupiter. (laughs) Very nostalgic. Well, I guess that's it for this evening, unless anybody else has anything further. So, um, yeah, thank you for joining us, uh, Brian and Gary. That was uh, really great. Um, and uh, thank you for everybody also shared uh, items as we've gone through tonight. I uh, reminded we will be back next week at the same time. So uh, I don't know if anybody ha- else has any final announcements. Are there any SIG groups this week, David? Or is it uh, an off week? No, no, I don't, off week? don't believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And um, there isn't. Uh, a star party this coming Saturday, but there will be one a week Saturday. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, get out and do some observing or photography week for everybody. So yeah, and do, do assignment. Yeah, and do do contact me if you're interested in starting a variable star observing. Yeah, and thanks for that offer, David. Great. Well, thank you all for the opportunity. It's great talking with you. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, thanks again second. for joining us. Thank you. We'll second that. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Take care. Good night. Night, everyone.